Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, Sönke. Um, my name is Berit Ebert. I'm Vice President of Programs here at the American Academy, and I welcome everyone to the Axel Springer Lecture, Age of Emergency, Colonial Violence at the End of the British Empire, by Eric Lindstrom, who is our Spring 2021 Axel Springer Fellow. The Axel Springer Fellowship was established in 2003 um, with the intention of promoting German-American dialogue in the fields of media, journalism, public policy, international relations, and history. Over several years by now, um, this fellowship has made it possible for more than 35 outstanding thinkers to come to the American Academy for a residency in Berlin, among them Anne Applebaum, George Packer, Laura Zikor, Daniel Zeblet, Dominic Boyer, very recently Matthew Aikens, and now Eric. Um, we are extremely grateful to the Axel Springer AG and Matthias Döpfner for supporting uh, this fellowship and for bringing such outstanding individuals over like Eric. Um, and there are several colleagues of Axel Springer here um, in the audience with us tonight. Um, so a very warm welcome to you. This is uh, also a very special evening um, with respect to other people in the audience. I'm not allowed to name names, my colleague told me before, but I will ignore that. And um, we'll welcome George Steinmetz and Veronica Fichtner, our uh, two alumni, uh, friends like Volker Heinz and Christine Wallach, and um, also um, Mr. and Mrs. Hahn, who are the parents of a very esteemed colleague here who organizes this lecture. So a uh, very warm transatlantic welcome. Tonight, Eric Lindstrom will explore the British experience with colonial violence and illuminate the gulf between awareness of violence on the one hand and actions to stop it on the other. Before we begin, I would like to welcome a very special guest who will introduce Eric Lindstrom today and moderate the following Q&A session after Eric's lecture. Um, and this is Sönke Neinzel. Sönke chairs the Department of War Studies at the University of Potsdam, which is the only university department in Germany whose research and teaching is dedicated to military history and to the cultural history of violence from the early modern period to the present day. In pursuit of this goal, the scholars and students examine the foundations, dynamics, and consequences of violent conflicts on the, on the national and international stage. And it is thus a very unique inter, uh, institute for interdisciplinary war studies. We're very honored to have you with us, Sunke. Some of you um, who are with us in the audience tonight um, might remember Sunke uh, from um, Peter Holquist's lecture in the spring of 2019. Um, which was about the laws of war and their Russian origins. And Zunke has already moderated the Q&A. And uh, Zunke, you did an excellent job. The expectations are extremely high today. Um, of course, uh, Zunke did a few more things than moderating events at the American Academy. He has a stellar career um, before joining the University of Potsdam faculty uh, six years ago. Um, Zunke served as the chair of international history at the um, London School of Economics and Political Science. And prior to that, he taught at the universities of Karlsruhe, Bern, Saarbrücken, and Glasgow. Zünke um, is an expert in international modern history and the history of war and organized violence in the modern era. He has written extensively about World War II, including the best-selling book Soldaten on fighting, killing, and dying, the secret Second World War tapes of German POWs. It was originally released in Germany in 2011 and subsequently pub published by Simon & Schuster in 2012. Um, it was a landmark book and this landmark book followed Zünke's discovery of conversations by German prisoners of war that were secretly recorded and transcribed by the British intelligence services. First declassified in 1996, they were found five years later by Zünke who proceeded to analyze their contents in collaboration with the social, social psychologist Harald Welzer. Um, this resulting book um, sheds new light on the compliance of German soldiers with national socialist brutality towards military and civ civilians alike. Um, it has been highly acclaimed um, among others um, in The Guardian. Ian Thompson calls it an essential documentary record and German historian, uh, historian Robert Gerwart writes that it, and I quote, deftly illustrates what ordinary men are capable of under the violent conditions of war. And this was published in the Irish Times. Um, 
sometimes I, uh, when I do these introductions, I uh, recommend books and I can only highly recommend this book. Um, so um, after this, uh, this lecture at the uh, Q&A, you all go online book shopping. Um, so we're very, very pleased um, to have Zunke and Eric to get together in conversation. Welcome to both of you. Um, before I turn over um, the word and the virtual floor to Zunke, um, I have to um, briefly say a word about the Zoom etiquette um, of today. So we will have the lecture, then we will have a brief conversation by Zunke and e Erik, and then um, you all um, have the possibility to ask questions. Please use the Q&A functions, which you find um, in the bottom of your screen. Um, don't use the raise your hand function. Uh, this is a yellow hand. You can use it. it will be hopeless, nothing will happen. Um, so with that, uh, <laughs> thank you, Zunke, thank you, Eric, and over to you. Yeah, Berit, many, many thanks for the kind introduction. It's, it's a great pleasure to be again at the American Academy and, and to collaborate with our War Studies program and the American Academy. And it's, it's a great, it's a great honor to, to, to moderate and introduce Eric Lindstrom uh, because he's interested in, in a topic which is really interesting. So we also uh, are running a project about uh, the culture of um, military violence. And there's a sub project also on Britain. So I think I, I'm going to learn a lot about Britain from Eric's lecture. So what can I say? So Eric is a, a associate professor at the University of Virginia. He holds degrees from the best universities of the world, from the bachelor degree from Princeton, a master and PhD from Harvard. So all fine with that. And he is a, although he's American, as he, as he told me, a purely American, um, how pure an American can be. So uh, he is a, an, an historian of uh, the British Empire. And his first book, his PhD, um, is on uh, psychology in the British Empire. And now he's about to write his second book after long years of research in London and, and elsewhere um, on the knowledge about colonial violence and, and post-1945. He, um, Eric, is a really an outstanding scholar. Uh, he has published uh, in the um, best um, journals of our, of our of history, journal of modern history, past and present. Um, and so um, I'm really interesting, uh, interested to see what he's what he found in the archives. And I can already, um, I'm still thinking about the parallels between Germany and Britain, about how they deal with their, you know, somehow problematic violence. And I think there are interesting parallels, especially if we are in Berlin, I think these parallels are, uh, we have to raise these. So Eric, um, it's a great pleasure for all of us um, to have you with us and, and you have such a, uh, rich research, uh, and you are here in, in Berlin at the American Academy to put this research uh, into, uh, into transfer this research into a book, and and we are very keen to know uh, what you have found so far um, about the age of emergency, the colonial violence at the end of the British Empire. So the floor is yours, Eric. Thank you so much, Zinka, for that kind introduction. Um, it's wonderful to finally actually be here in Berlin. It's frankly also a bit surreal, but I look forward to talking more with you, uh, hopefully in person at a safe distance uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, I'd just like to take a, a moment before I start to thank everyone who made this uh, fellowship possible uh, under these incredibly difficult circumstances. Uh, certainly, uh, Axel Springer, uh, Gay, I'm very conscious of the great honor uh, of giving the lecture uh, in your name tonight. Uh, everyone at the Academy, this fantastic staff who have made it possible for us to come here, as I said, under quite difficult circumstances. Uh, my fellow fellows who have been giving terrific talks over the past few weeks, I look forward to talking with you more uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and finally, all of you who are here on Zoom, um, I think we're all suffering from Zoom fatigue uh, in varying degrees uh, by this time after a long pandemic year, so I really uh, am grateful that you're here. Uh, and although I can't see who exactly is here, I know we have a mix of uh, my fellow specialists uh, from British Imperial history and related fields, and also a more general audience. So I'm going to do my very best to um, to bridge that gap and, and to speak uh, to both of you tonight. So, right. Uh, so I, I have to say, uh, it's an interesting time, to put things mildly, to be talking about the violence of empire and its legacies. Today, it's become almost a commonplace to say that decolonization uh, 
is not just a distant historical event, but an ongoing process and a moral imperative, which demands that we confront the origins of Western capitalism and Western knowledge in the conquest of imperial rule. The uh, most concrete example of this at the moment uh, in Germany uh, and in Britain uh, might be the Benin Bronzes, uh, which as many of you know, uh, were seized from West Africa in the so-called uh, punitive expedition of the British army in 1897. And it's only just in the last 24 hours, I think that the uh, newly opened Humboldt Forum here in Berlin has announced that it will begin the process perhaps uh, of uh, returning uh, the Benin Bronzes to uh, what is today Nigeria, uh, despite the fact that the British Museum uh, among other Western collections uh, have continued to uh, display them. In any case, the language of decolonization, which has become so ubiquitous today, recognizes that these kinds of imperial legacies are far from unfinished, that they continue to shape inequalities and identities in the world today. Rather than pursuing that argument now, though, I actually want to pose a different set of questions. What lies behind moments of reckoning like these? Why are the violent legacies of empire harder to ignore or forget at some times than at others? And if we are today experiencing something like a return of the repressed colonial past, why is it happening now? Well, I would date the origins of our current moment of reckoning to the aftermath of September 11th, 2001, and I admit here that there is an element of history as autobiography, because this is also roughly the moment that I became seriously interested in uh, British uh, imperial history uh, for the first time. And um, without psychoanalyzing myself too much, I do think there's, there's something to this uh, moment. Uh, because it was in the early to mid 2000s, as the United States and Britain were going to war in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, that talk of targeted counterinsurgencies and winning hearts and minds soon collided with the grim realities of shock and awe in Abu Ghraib. And it was at this moment, I think, it was against this backdrop that the idea that America might itself be an empire, which of course is so alien to American political culture in all kinds of ways, this idea was suddenly everywhere. Uh, and it was at this moment then that historians of the last great global empire, the British Empire, rushed to explain what this meant, what it might mean for America to be an empire. As many of you may know, there was a right-wing version of this response, which held that the US should embrace its imperial destiny by modeling itself on the British example, its bureaucratic efficiency, its cultural expertise, and so on. But the more common response from historians, and this is what I found really inspirational at the time and have continued to find inspirational sense. The more common response was for historians to treat the British imperial past as a cautionary tale, to situate the war on terror in a longer genealogy of dirty wars fought in the name of empire. And much of this research focused on the counterinsurgencies which Britain waged in colonies around the world in the years after the Second World War, in what we might call the long 1950s, uh, in Palestine, Malaya, Cyprus, and Kenya, among others. Now, these conflicts long enjoyed a reputation among military strategists and others uh, for clean and efficient tactics. Again, the idea of winning hearts and minds dates precisely uh, to this moment. But what a wave of research uh, by historians uh, in the early and mid-2000s showed, and in the years since, is that torture and summary executions and collective punishments and other abuses were all standard features of the British playbook to beat back anti-colonial insurgencies in the 1950s. So this was British imperial history in a much more critical vein than I think had ever been seen before. And it was also clearly imperial history as a history of the present, a project made possible by the shared habits and common traditions of the United States and Britain as nominally liberal empires, which promised to liberate and educate even as they conquer and rule. So there was a kind of symmetry between the British counterinsurgencies of the 50s and the American-led counterinsurgencies of the early 2000s, uh, which I think made 
uh, a new awareness of empire and the violence of empire possible. Um, perhaps this was an unusually clear case of the past weighing on the present, an almost ideal illustration of what Michael Rothberg has called multi-directional memory. The reactivation of past traumas by present injustices, as well as the attempt to make sense of the present in light of the past. I think this moment also turned out to be an example of what we might call the cascading logic of collective memory. Revelations beget further revelations, silences and taboos once broken are not easily resurrected. So in 2009, a group of elderly Kenyans who were victims of torture in the 1950s filed a lawsuit against the British government in the British High Court, which drew heavily on uh, the new scholarship of historians. Um, and I want to particularly mention here Caroline Elkins, uh, one of my former graduate advisors, as well as David Anderson and Hugh Bennett. Uh, three years later, the British government agreed to a settlement, including an official apology and a compensation fund of 20 million pounds for the remaining survivors. This outcome then inspired the victims of torture in other late colonial wars to pursue claims of their own. Uh, another lawsuit from survivors of the counterinsurgency in Cyprus was settled uh, just two years ago. Perhaps most significantly, as we think about a kind of cascading logic of revelation, the surfacing of uh, forgotten traumas. The Kenya case led to the discovery or the revelation, perhaps I should say, of a secret archive of files removed from British colonies at the time of decolonization and held at an intelligence facility in the English countryside. These files documented the very allegations of torture which Britain had long denied. They contained sensitive materials about other former British colonies as well. At the same time, new evidence emerged about the scale of document destruction at the end of empire. The shredding sessions, the bonfires, which sought to prevent embarrassing information, embarrassing that is uh, from the British perspective, from falling into the hands of post-colonial governments as Britain retreated. These disclosures, I think, were reminders that the archive is yet another institution shaped by colonial violence. And of course, the history then is a discipline which has been shaped by it as well, uh, even uh, perhaps unwittingly. Now, understandably, many observers drew a similar conclusion from this flurry of revelations about colonial violence. That long suppressed truths about the dark side of the British Empire were coming to light at last. Uh, critic Paul Gilroy referred to, quote, buried knowledge, a hidden shameful store of imperial horrors. Uh, one historian observed that, quote, it is only today becoming clear how much information about the seamy side of empire was kept from people at the time. And there were many other comments uh, along the same lines from historians and journalists, which I won't bother to quote here. But it is this narrative, uh, the narrative of a progression from secrecy to openness, from repression to awareness, from ignorance to knowledge, which I want to question uh, in my talk this evening. Is the confrontation with the imperial past best understood as a matter of bringing concealed truths to the surface? Or does this story risk replacing old myths of imperial benevolence with new myths of imperial secrecy? Is this present moment of reckoning truly a new departure, or is it rather a variation on deeper structures of remembrance? Well, in fact, I think it is possible to situate discussions of colonial violence today in a longer genealogy of revelation. This is not the first time, in other words, that a kind of multi-directional memory has brought the brutality of the decolonization era to the surface. So if we begin then to move backward in time, another moment of reckoning took place in the 1970s and the early 1980s in response to against the backdrop of the troubles in Northern Ireland. As anyone who knows this period can tell you, this was, uh, of course, a moment of secrecy and censorship in some quite significant ways. But it was also a moment of intense public controversy about the use of torture on IRA prisoners, which was the subject of two uh, very high profile government inquiries, several lawsuits, countless press stories, books, and films. <clears throat> 
And many of these texts, these public texts, referred explicitly to the fact that the British army was deploying techniques in Northern Ireland, which it had developed earlier in Palestine and Malaya and Kenya and Cyprus and so on. Uh, a book I'm sure many of you uh, know, uh, John le Carre's great spy novel, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, published in 1974, bears the imprint of this moment. Uh, and filling out the backstory of the character Ricky Tarr, Le Carre included this detail, quote, he hung around Malaya and did a couple more jobs before being called back to Brixton and refitted for special operations in Kenya, or in less sophisticated language, hunting Mau Mau for bounty. Another artifact of this period is the television movie Psy Warriors, short for uh, Psychological Warriors, as you can see there. Uh, directed by the great radical filmmaker Alan Clark. Uh, and Psy Warriors aired on the BBC in 1981. Coincidentally, as it turned out, on the very same night that IRA fighter Bobby Sands died of a hunger strike uh, in prison. And as a result, the BBC was flooded with angry phone calls that uh, the airwaves had been turned over to pro-IRA uh, propaganda. As you can see from this still, Psy Warriors offered a stark visual representation of torture sensory deprivation and related techniques by the British armed forces. But the script also took pains to situate the abuses of the troubles in a longer history of colonial violence. As one military character says in the film, quote, I spent the greater part of my working life watching British troops being pulled out of places they were never going to leave. A long, hard line of colonial campaigns. And on every campaign, the British used internment, concentration camps, and intense interrogation, torture. What you see in Ulster is the rear end of the cruelty and exploitation of over 30 colonial wars. The last colonial battlefield, the dog devouring its own tail. When there's nothing left to devour, we'll devour ourselves." End quote. Let's move further back in time uh, to yet another moment of what we might call resurgent memory in the late 60s and early 70s during the American War in Vietnam. And here it was parallels with the British War in Malaya particularly, another jungle conflict in Southeast Asia with soldiers resettling populations on a massive scale, burning down huts, sometimes shooting unarmed civilians. Uh, it was these parallels which then inspired an uncomfortable round of introspection. Uh, senior labor politician George Brown, who had been a government minister uh, during the start of the Malayan emergency in the late 1940s, uh, told the press that, quote, uh, there are an awful lot of specters in our cupboard too, close quote. And Brown was even more forthcoming uh, in private. Uh, the theater critic uh, Kenneth Tynan in his diary uh, recorded a rather interesting conversation with Brown at a gin soaked lunch in 1971, uh, in which Brown said, quote, we burned and tortured and maimed in Malaya, where war is concerned in for a penny and for a pound, end quote. Uh, meanwhile, uh, intense press coverage of the My Lai massacre perpetrated by American soldiers in 1968 led directly to a re-examination of perhaps the most notorious British crime of the Malayan War, the 1948 massacre at Batang Kali, in which British troops killed at least 24 unarmed men. Uh, and this re-examination included front page newspaper stories, as you see, a BBC documentary, and a criminal investigation. We could continue moving backwards along the timeline. I think another notable feature of the 1960s was that post-colonial subjects who experienced the violence of counterinsurgency firsthand began to tell their stories in ways that reached the British public. Of course, it's not that these voices weren't speaking before, it's that they were being heard now in Britain in ways that they weren't being heard before. Uh, a new publishing genre, the Mau Mau memoir, is perhaps the best known example of that. But by now you will see my point. The brutality of colonial war was hardly ever forgotten, hardly invisible, hardly repressed. It was less a secret, even an open secret, than a past that would not pass. And this raises the question of whether secrecy and violence need each other as much as we sometimes tend to assume. 
Uh, in fact, at the very moment that these wars were being fought in the 1950s, knowledge of torture and other abuses rippled through British society. And we move now really to the heart of the work I'm doing uh, here in Berlin to, to ask this question, to answer this question of what people in Britain knew and how they knew about the brutality of colonial war. Different communities or circles of knowing linked metropolitan Britain to colonial conflict zones. But in so doing, they generated archives of atrocity, public archives of atrocity in real time. Uh, Left-wing activists compiled testimony, photographs, and other forms of evidence. Uh, they publicized them often through a world of cheap print, of pamphlets and partisan uh, newspapers and mimeographed newsletters. And I think in many ways, it, it might not be too much to say that the origin of uh, the forensic mode of human rights that we know today, this emphasis on a documentary proof on achieving a kind of legalistic standard of proof uh, to document uh, atrocities um, does go back in some ways to this moment. Although Amnesty International wasn't founded until 1961, I think it's very significant that the two co-founders uh, were both involved in um, uh, the campaign against uh, atrocities in Cyprus, particularly uh, as well um, in Peter Benson's case uh, in Kenya. The soldiers who fought colonial wars also recorded and shared experiences of violence, though of course in very different ways. Uh, many wrote letters home, uh, sometimes mentioning brutality in passing, sometimes venting their disgust or anger with fellow soldiers who inflicted it, sometimes bragging or enthusing about it. There's a whole range of responses, all of which revealed the fact and the extent of brutality in different ways. A surprising number of soldiers published memoirs or novels about their experiences. Uh, and this gives rise, I think, to a whole genre of what we might call counterinsurgency pulp. Uh, these are texts which really often revel in gruesome violence, uh, and they seem to want to initiate domestic audiences into uh, the rights of violence. Uh, in other words, there's, there's an effort consciously, perhaps, perhaps unconsciously, um, to build support for colonial war by forcing people at home to confront what these wars are really uh, about. In other words, there's no assumption here that revealing details about brutality is going to undercut public support for these wars. Other circles of knowing, other communities of knowing. The missionaries and aid workers uh, who worked in detention camps uh, often witnessed abuses, then reflected on how to respond in consultations with colleagues back home. Uh, and in so doing, they drew ever wider circles into debates about the moral trade-offs of colonial war. Uh, allegations of wrongdoing were passed systematically up the hierarchies of some very hierarchical organizations, including the Church of England uh, and the British Red Cross. And of course, it's a great um, a bit of good fortune for historians to be able to trace allegations as they moved through these highly bureaucratic, these highly regimented organizations. Uh, journalists, too, often witnessed disturbing scenes, then recorded them in their notebooks, uh, shared them with colleagues in the field or editors back home. And while the details that reporters collected, the details of atrocity which reporters collected, did not always make it into public view, into print or on the air, many details did make it into public view. In other words, press coverage of counterinsurgency was not as uniformly propagandistic or rose-tinted as we might expect. And I think we need to see journalists here as working um, under the pressure of cross-cutting forces. On the one hand, a, a certain conservatism, a, a caution, a culture of deference to officials who denied atrocity. But on the other hand, a kind of imperative to provide vivid images of counterinsurgency to audiences back home. And um, many of these images were uh, framed, there we go. Uh, they were framed in ways which I think communicated a, a definite moral ambiguity. Um, this was not always uh, reliable uh, propaganda. And, and the image you see here was taken in Cyprus in Famagusta in 1958. Um, there was an incident in which the wife of a British soldier was murdered by uh, Aoka uh, fighters. 
And British soldiers, by all accounts, then went on a rampage against every Greek Cypriot man they could find. Um, and images of, of the bandaged heads of those who were wounded um, were published widely in Britain. They were um, broadcast uh, on television. They were included in newsreels, which were shown in cinemas. And I, I believe the assumption was that um, the justification of a British soldier's wife being murdered would, would be enough to sort of make this sort of imagery acceptable. And perhaps that's something more we can talk about uh, in the Q&A. In any case, the demand for vividness, the demand for a certain kind of um, immediacy for more reporting, I think, um, could be a double-edged sword as far as uh, the politics of war are concerned. And then finally, there was an outpouring of politically conscious entertainment, which dramatized the moral dilemmas of counterinsurgency. Playwrights and screenwriters, some of them veterans of colonial wars themselves, took audiences inside army barracks, detention camps, and interrogation rooms, uh, and also inside the homes of families divided by conscription and protest and patriotism. Uh, and in the theater world, it was those two sort of outposts from uh, the typical West End scene, the liberal royal court and the more radical theater workshop, um, which uh, really turned out uh, plays on the theme of colonial war in the late 1950s, some of them by quite well-known figures like John Osborne and Doris Lessing, others somewhat less known uh, like uh, Willis Hall, whose play The Long, The Short, and The Tall uh, dramatized um, the dilemma of a British unit in Malaya debating whether or not to murder uh, a prisoner. So playwrights returned to these themes repeatedly, um, and so did those who wrote for television. This was, in many ways, the golden age of television drama in Britain. Uh, the BBC and the ITV, and ITV rather, uh, churned out uh, this sort of new edgy genre of on-screen dramas about cracked up interrogators and traumatized soldiers. So I think that we have to think about an aesthetic of late colonial violence uh, as well, which, which has a very um, complex politics. In all of these ways, and uh, in other ways, I think violence reached far beyond the conflict zones of empire. When I think about this history, I think it's helpful to think about the distinction between secrecy and ignorance, or secrecy in the absence of knowledge. Details about colonial violence were often treated as secrets. So we know that officials worked energetically and in some cases successfully to keep them out of the press, to keep them out of public view. Uh, when politicians and humanitarian leaders and other influential figures learned about abuses through private channels, their instinct often was to confer with government ministers behind closed doors rather than to go public. So there's a culture of, I think, elite discretion, uh, which is uh, absolutely part of the story of colonial war in this period. But secrecy is never simply a matter of suppressing information. It also always draws attention to that information weaves networks of complicity around it, confers a charged status on it. So one reason for this is that the disturbing accounts which did emerge into public view were all the more shocking precisely because others were kept quiet. Another is that the never ending work of litigating secrecy, policing the boundaries of what could or should be disclosed to the public was never itself a secret. It was not just officials, who were engaged in this work, but also reporters and missionaries and soldiers and settlers and other intermediaries who found themselves in the position of having to decide whether they should publicize what they knew or keep silent. So this is the paradox of secrecy in a liberal society. As historian Tom Crook puts it, quote, citizens know what they cannot know. Even if information deemed secret by the state is never disclosed in its fullness, liberal subjects can nonetheless glimpse something of its existence. I think suppressing information about colonial violence proved difficult for another reason as well. While officials sought to conceal the dark side of colonial war, they could never renounce publicity altogether because they wanted to build popular support for these conflicts. Secrecy and propaganda need each other after all. One creates the informational vacuum filled by the half-truths and manipulations of the other. 
The relationship between secrecy and propaganda, I think, assumed a particularly complex form in post-war Britain because the coercive dimensions of counterinsurgency were so deeply entangled with the camera-friendly work of appealing to hearts and minds. Detention camps were simultaneously sites of punishment and sites of so-called rehabilitation. Intrusive searches, mass roundups, and forced relocations turned communities upside down in the name of protecting them. So these contradictions meant that many British civilians worked hand in glove with security forces and witnessed many of their worst abuses. They also reflected the fact that officials understood colonial war in part as a spectacle. The performance of a civilizing mission rooted in stern yet benevolent paternalism. Certain kinds of violence had to be visible so that they could be folded into this narrative, justified and even celebrated. Allowing spectators at home to participate vicariously in the tough choices of colonial war, at least to an extent, was a strategy for manufacturing consent. So in this context, the mystique of secrecy, the sensation of peeking behind the curtain of military operations, which is the conceit of so much press coverage as well as, as, well as some of the, the plays and films and novels and other creative texts uh, that I mentioned, um, that conceit uh, can have the effect of amplifying violence rather than concealing it. Part of what's at stake here, I think, is the question of how we relate to the 1950s. Is this a distant past or is this a quite near past? And I think in, in some ways, it would be very easy to imagine this gray, austere, war-scarred period as a time very different than our own, where sensitivity to this kind of violence is concerned. I would say, though, that what makes this history so unsettling is precisely that it does not belong to a distant past. Uh, then, as now, the ambiguity of emergencies and exceptions, which furnished the legal basis for war, allowed its consequences to unfold in a twilight state of limited accountability. Then, as now, states proved adept at circumventing and co-opting protections for human rights, even as they paid lip service to them. Then, as now, communication links and media coverage closed the informational gap between conflict zones and home fronts without closing the empathy gap between them. Then as now calls for restraint on the use of force had to compete with vocal support for brutal and vengeful and indiscriminate violence. Now one response to that might be, wasn't this always the case? What's new about the 1950s? And, and of course, the forms of violence we're talking about, the forms of colonial violence are not new. Uh, they build on not just decade old, but in fact, century old traditions and distinctly British traditions, I might add. And yet, I think several distinctive features of this post-1945 world did intensify the reverberations of colonial violence in Britain. And I think this creates a situation not unlike the present in which violence could be justified or tolerated, but it could never be completely ignored. So I've hinted at a few of these uh, factors, and let me just now walk through a few more for you in turn. First is the legacy of the Second World War itself. Now, this was, of course, not a simple matter of lessons learned about the horrors of state violence. Uh, the human rights regime, which emerged from the war, as many of you will know, was designed in large part to perpetuate empire rather than constrain it. But the belief that Britain had fought a good war in moral terms against Germany did complicate responses to counterinsurgency. And I've, I've picked just one example here almost at, at random, but this is rhetoric that you do see in quite a um, pervasive way, um, particularly among left-wing critics of colonial war uh, in this period. Uh, uncomfortable parallels in the use of torture, collective punishment, uh, detention camps, and so on, prompted critics of colonial war to decry what they described as Gestapo tactics or totalitarian methods. Apologists for colonial war, for their part, sometimes employed euphemisms for torture like rough handling or rough treatment, 
And I think the aim here was not just to minimize the extent of the brutality involved, but to suggest a kind of incidental garden variety callousness rather than the ideologically motivated violence of Nazism. And of course, this was a tactic which conceded quite a lot in order to try to downplay its significance, but it does show the extent to which awareness of violence was sort of permeated with uh, a sense of uh, the very present and recent history of the Second World War. A second factor here is that the colonial wars of the 1950s were fought in significant measure by conscripts uh, rather than by career soldiers. And setting aside the, of course, exceptional circumstances of the two world wars, this kind of mass conscription was unprecedented in British history. Between 1948 and 1963, every British man between the age of 17 and 21 was liable to be called up for military service. And while exact figures are impossible to calculate for a variety of reasons, perhaps roughly 100,000 national servicemen, as they were called, did serve in colonial wars. So because this pool of actual and potential colonial warriors was so large, to say nothing of the still larger circles of their families and friends and so on, these conflicts really did, I think, represent a kind of looming inescapable presence in everyday life. This was the market for that cottage industry of books and plays and films, as well as a never ending stream of press coverage. And with conscripts circulating in and out of conflict zones and in and out of civilian and military life, the letters and photographs and other forms of evidence that I mentioned earlier reached far beyond the world of professional fighting men. Uh, third, the age of colonial emergency was also a golden age of communications. And, and in some ways, I have to say, this is a matter of old fashioned information channels simply becoming more important than they had been uh, before. Uh, fueled by the expansion of air freight, the volume of British mail overseas uh, reached new highs in the 1950s. Uh, the peak was 524 million letters in 1957 in terms of British mail carried overseas. But of course, the vividness, the immediacy which ushered colonial war into British homes was also a product of media. Newspapers, which were never read more widely than they were in the 1950s, the Second World War was a very good war for newspapers. Uh, and I'll also add that uh, newspapers in this period integrated photographs more fully than ever before. Uh, illustrated weeklies like Picture Post, um, which I showed you briefly earlier, um, would be another example of that. Radio, of course, which is to say the BBC, and, and the new medium of television. Um, and, and perhaps we can talk more about how those different media shape different visions of colonial war in the Q&A. Finally, uh, the colonial wars of the 1950s fueled new kinds of politics. Because a broad swath of consensus among party leaders had the effect of dampening controversy, um, much of the time at least, where colonial war was concerned, the most impassioned debates about colonial war were waged at the extremes, uh, politically speaking. So on the left, uh, activist traditions, older activist traditions like the pacifist movement and the communist movement were joined by newcomers like the movement for colonial freedom, uh, which as I think you can see from this picture, projected a distinctive brand of post-imperial and multicultural conscience, a, a sort of different appeal to conscious than what we've seen in uh, earlier periods. And of course, leading figures of the new left, including Stuart Hall and E.P. Thompson, cut their teeth on criticism of the wars in Egypt, Cyprus, and Kenya. On the far right, meanwhile, a resurgent fascist movement exploited enthusiasm for racial conflict overseas. And by the end of the decade, about a supposedly ignominious retreat from empire. The groups which led directly to the formation of the anti-immigrant National Front in the late 1960s, including the League of Empire Loyalists and the National Labor Party, drew maximum attention to their cause in the 1950s by staging provocative rallies, provoking brawls with anti-colonial campaigners, and running candidates for public office who blended imperialism, racism, xenophobia, and revanchist militarism. 
this is perhaps a good place to conclude because it underlines how much of the era of colonial war continues to shape our world today. It's not just, I think, the history of empire that's been shaped by assumptions about secrecy and openness, the language of breaking silences or shining light into dark corners remains a prominent part of movements for change of all kinds. But the ubiquity of knowledge about colonial violence in private and in public in the 1950s and ever since reminds us that transparency has no intrinsic politics. Graphic revelations have served the aims of those who wanted tougher wars and cleaner wars as well as those who wanted no war or empire at all. So rather than assuming that a final moment of reckoning has arrived at last today, we might think instead in terms of a long running effort to convert awareness of atrocity into engagement and action. And this I think is why it's so important to examine the ideas and the institutions which made it possible for so many to knowingly live with the violence committed in their name. I'll stop there. Thanks so much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Great, Eric. This was a wonderful talk, a brilliant talk, and um, which I think we can we can have a lot of questions. I I always thought when you talked about the ubiquity of of knowledge um, that that um, I mean, it was so present in the end. Um, I always you know reminds me to the discussion in Germany that that um, colleagues like Jörg Echtenkamp always argued well in the 50s and the 60s of course the German West German at least the West German society did not talk openly about atrocities of the second world war but they knew about it you know in secret measures and they exactly knew what they don't want to address too openly, but the knowledge was always there. So, I mean, of course, German history is different to the British history, but I think the grammar, I think somehow is, is possibly comparable. So I, I uh, but we can, can, can talk about that um, over a beer uh, in, in springtime um, um, by the lake or so. But I would, I would like to ask you two questions. Um, and possibly not everyone listening is an expert in colonial violence. So you, you mentioned British colonial violence, but what kind of violence are we talking about? So because if we looking for so imperial wars, imperial history, we have from, I don't know, 15th century onwards, we have even genocides. If we look at Tasmania, for example, where the British settlers killed um, all um, indigenous people, but what kind so for me as a as somebody who worked on the holocaust and german atrocities a massacre with 28 victims is i mean it's it's it's, it's horrible but still the dimension uh, for for german terms is is yeah. is is very different so um so what kind of violence are we talking about and and of course the intention camps can be can be awful but i mean if we hear concentration camps especially in germany we uh, we have somehow a different um imagination possibly so then that's that's important i think and and of course we have to compare if we have violence particular violence so is that a violence which is outstanding in comparison to france for example to other portugal spain etc or is it a violence which is which is um, less extreme but we have a british frame of reference and the British frame of reference might be different to the French one, the Spanish one, the Portuguese one. So it's always relative, not, not absolute. So what kind of dimension of violence are we talking about? And, and I mean, obviously it's it's lesser than, than the German case, but um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So why, why was it then discussed in, in, in that way? If possibly other countries like France, et cetera, they killed many, many more people, or the, the war in Vietnam, et cetera. And, and the other thing I would like to address is um, you know, possibly Isabel Hull's book uh, about absolute destruction on the British, the German way of war. And, and also, she wrote a book on uh, Germany in the First World War, Scrap of Paper. And her key argument was that in these times, 
Britain did care about humanitarian law, even if the British were going to break it. So, which was an interesting argument, uh, also caused some critique. But uh, I think the, I think she was right in a way that humanitarian law in 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 that time mattered for the British, and especially even more after the First World War, after colonial massacres in, in India, there was an outcry again in Britain. And, and I would think so that if we leave out for a moment the air war or land war, the British had a, in the Second World War, a different frame of, of reference. And I would make the argument, it's still a hypothesis that the British committed less atrocities in the Second World War than the Americans or the Canadians also, because they had a different frame of reference. Um, and the interesting question would be, do you think that uh, there's a continuation that, that Britain was, I mean, still atrocities, etc., but in comparison to others, was a more civilized and in inverted commas um, a nation? Yes, they did torture people and, and there was detention camps, but in comparison to others, not on the same scale because it was a tradition of humanitarian law, etc. Or would you think, no, no, Second World War was one thing, post-45 is another. Now the British were confronted with counterinsurgency campaigns, which there never were in, in, in the World Wars. It was more the Axis powers, etc., who had you know guerrilla warfare. And now they were in the in the coin trap and counterinsurgency trap, and they faced the same. Uh, the same things as other powers, uh, the French, the Germans, whatever, the Russians, uh, and they did the same mistakes. And again, here we are, uh, welcome to the club. Or, or, or would you see there, there, is a, uh, there is a difference that still humanitarian law was so strong wow. in British history? And I discussed it with, with, when I traveled to India with Indian colleagues, and they were, as you could imagine, very anti-British and uh, did not want to distinguish. So what, what would you think about that? This yeah, I mean, it's, of... yeah, that's very interesting, Zinka. Um, I'm, I'm still piecing together my thoughts, actually. It's very, it's very provocative. No. I mean, I suppose my first instinct, and this will be the instinct of you know, many of my, my field colleagues who are watching, will be to feel uneasy about the comparative question precisely because it was used at the time and has been used since to excuse and justify and, and, and wipe away any sort of British reckoning. And, um, you know, I think uh, it, in comparative terms, you know, if we're talking about numbers of, of people killed and numbers of people tortured, probably, you know, um, the closest analog, the, the fairest analog perhaps is um, the French counterinsurgency in Algeria. And these were smaller conflicts, uh, certainly taken one at a time than, than that one was. And so, um, yeah, perhaps we can talk about a, a, a smaller scale of violence. I'm not sure we can talk about, um, a, a smaller or lesser intensity or brutality of violence. You know, torture is torture, and I'm not particularly interested in, in going down that that path for reasons yeah. you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and then, and I will just say um, this is a very that this comparative question and what we might call a comparative deflection is very ubiquitous at the time. And you know, there's a fascinating exchange that that, that leaps to mind when Eric Hobsbawm writes to the Manchester Guardian, I believe in. 54 or 55 and, and, and just draws attention to the hypocrisy of, of the British tradition of humanitarianism yeah. being completely belied by actions in Kenya and Cyprus and elsewhere. And uh, then a, a more conservative uh, historian writes in and immediately says, how can you possibly speak about British crimes without first thinking about Soviet crimes? And so, um, you know, particularly in a Cold War environment in the 1950s, that's the deflection that you perhaps see uh, the most. Um, but it's it's very pervasive, and I think it does continue today. And so, for me, while, while it's possible to acknowledge certainly that these are smaller conflicts in some measurable ways, and these were certainly not genocidal conflicts, I'm very comfortable saying that. Although clearly there is a British genocidal tradition of settler colonialism in places like Australia and elsewhere, which you mentioned, um, we can say that. Um, but to go beyond that, for me, I think is not a particularly fruitful. Yep. Um, path precisely because it's it's such a, a pervasive um, you know sort of rhetorical deflection. Um, I, I, for me, the, the relevance of the Second World War precedent, you know, we could certainly quibble about you know um, again comparative atrocities in, in the Second World War, um, which again is, is not an especially savory approach to take, perhaps. But I, I do think the scale generally of violence and the horrors of genocide in the Second World War. 
uh, although I emphasize one dimension of that in the talk, also played in another way, which is simply, and this is something that left-wing activists said repeatedly in the 1950s, um, after Auschwitz, after Hiroshima, how can you get people to care about, you know, the, the 12 yeah. kids who were killed in the Hola massacre, for instance, yeah. uh, or, or 11 dead at the Hola massacre in 1959 in Kenya. So um, again, that's, that's a problematic, which is there at the time. And I, I do think the second world war works both ways. Um, it is a kind of standard, which critics can mobilize to try to draw attention to the way in which Britain's not living up to ideals, which it is at least nominally paying lip service to, perhaps in, in more renewed ways in this period. Um, but also there is just the sense that comparatively, you know, a, a shrugging of the shoulder, shoulders, how is this really anything to worry about? And I think then that helps to explain why there could be such openness yeah. about yeah. brutality, right? And, and so it, it, it becomes something I can sort of incorporate into my explanatory yeah. framework, if you like. But it's it's a it's a provocative point, but it's it's a point well taken as well. So I, I appreciate. Uh, would you would you agree to Isabel Hull that the British cared more about humanitarian law even if they broke it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know the the whole <laughs> the whole thesis is um, fascinating, and of course it's a terrific book, and she's a terrific historian. I'm not sure I I'm totally persuaded by it because of course her her counterexample to the the Herrero genocide is is the Boer War which again is, is not perhaps genocidal, but that's maybe the, the, the best thing we can say about it. So, yeah. um, you know, the, the idea that those ideals are honored in the breach, perhaps that is a kind of particularly British tradition of hypocrisy where, you know, some other powers don't even bother to pay lip service to the ideals. Um, but in the end, I, I'm not sure I'm persuaded that that has a measurable effect on, on the way these wars actually turn out as opposed to yeah. other other factors yeah right so thank you very much and, and everyone who's going to listen and wants to to raise questions please write these questions uh in the q and a and the first one is dan kennedy uh thanks you for a fascinating and, and persuasive talk and her question concerns the domestic politics that arose in response to colonial violence. Mm -hmm. so, um, she asks, you, you know that the main politic response occurred on the fringes, the far left, the far right. What about the mainstream politics? If colonial violence was so well known, why did it generate so little concern among those in the political mainstream? Or did I misconstrue your argument? So what about the mainstream? Right, excellent, excellent question, Dane. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. <sighs> It's difficult. So I think, you know, many historians who have looked at the politics of this period have argued that consensus around colonial issues generally begins to break down in the mid 1950s. And, and certainly the fact that you have conservative governments taking over the war in Malaya and then launching wars in Kenya and Cyprus helps to achieve a little bit of a partisan polarization, even at the center. Um, and one reason that the movement for colonial freedom is as important and influential as it is, and, and, and the reason it's ultimately moral influential than, say, the League of Empire Loyalists on the right, is that it does manage to capture a relatively significant slice of the Parliamentary Labor Party. As you know, labor left figures like Barbara Castle do sort of become important um, spokespeople for um, campaigns against colonial violence. And I think this does become increasingly significant um, as the 1950s goes on, although the intensity, the, the vitriol of, um, you know, the counter criticism to people like Barbara Castle, which I think is um, not just tinged with misogyny, it's sort of soaked with misogyny is, is also a, a point sort of worth keeping in mind here. So yes, the, these issues do come into the mainstream. I think that tends to be more sporadic and episodic. There are moments when attention is crystallized and outrage is mobilized. Um, the Hola massacre uh, in Kenya in 1959 would be one example of that, perhaps the best known example of that. There's a, a big parliamentary debate at that point. Um, I do think the attack in Famagusta in 1958, which I mentioned is another moment, and there are others, um, you know, um, which we could think about. Uh, Tanjong Malam uh, is an interesting case in Malaya in the late 40s, uh, I'm sorry, in the early 50s, uh, after General Templar takes over. So there are moments when parliamentary debates are to be had on these issues, but I think the counter reaction against someone like Barbara Castle, which is so intense and so brutal, and, and to read the transcripts of the BBC interview she did after going to Cyprus and then coming back and making allegations about misconduct in which she was accused of undermining troops in the field and, and, and that sort of thing, the, the intensity, the brutality of that counter response, I think became sort of a cautionary tale 
for many politicians. So yes, there are prominent voices. Um, it, people with seats in parliament who are making these points. Fenner Brockway, of course, is another really significant figure. Um, but they are seen ultimately, I think, as fringe figures. So it, I think part of the, the question here is ultimately a, a semantic question of who belongs to the mainstream and, and who doesn't. Um, but regardless of who's on the fringe or who's in the mainstream, I, I do think that the fact is that these are causes which can capture public attention. Um, and yes, I think that the fringe element can limit that reach in some cases, but at, at other moments, these really do um, capture a wide swath of public attention in politics and in, in media and, and so on. There's another question. Um, so why is this specific period in history labeled the age of emergency? Good question. <laughs> you're, you're, you're testing me on my title. Um, yes, so, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so, well, you know, I, I, I the first point to make, um, you know, particularly for non-specialists, is that um, the, the legal designation for these conflicts was not wars, um, it was states of emergency. Uh, and so the, the, the title first is a play on that sort of reality. And this is part of a longer imperial tradition, a rhetorical tradition of trying to downplay the seriousness of colonial conflicts. So they would be called low intensity conflicts or little wars, if you can believe that in the 19th yeah. century. Um, or police actions or uh, emergencies or states of emergency. So that's sort of the, the first point to make here. Um, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that um, these were not just legal states of emergency in various British colonies, but that there was a kind of ongoing atmosphere of emergency in some ways in Britain itself. And that's sort of the, the hardest thesis I'm, I'm trying to prove. Um, and, and I do think that the sense of a moral emergency is something that many contemporaries feel. Again, this is, um, this is not to say that everyone is alarmed by colonial violence because many people clearly are either fine with it or are actually sort of enthused and excited about it. And we could talk more about that range of responses. Um, but even for them, there is a sense that this is a kind of final battle for Britain's empire. And that's part of the significance of, of these conflicts. So, so what I'm trying to do with that title is to um, make the case for the significance of these conflicts, not just to imperial history out there, but to Britain itself. And of course, this is part of a, a longer, um, uh, how do I put this, a, a wave or a movement among historians uh, of Britain to try to chronicle the ways in which empire does matter at home, uh, as it were, rather than just somewhere beyond uh, the sea. That itself can become a sort of problematic rhetorical path, but I, I won't go further down that, that hole for now. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. So the next question would be, did the racial makeup of colonial people play any role in the perception of their treatment by different groups in the UK? Yeah, that, yeah, terrific question. So, um, Zinka, earlier when you uh, were first asking me about- this is, uh, this is just the questions from the audience, which I read out, it's not my no, question. I no, no, I know, but, but I, I was gonna say, it calls back to the first question you made, yeah, when I thought yeah. you were going to ask, is colonial violence really a thing? You know, is this a yeah, coherent yeah. concept, which yeah. is an interesting yeah. debate we, we could maybe engage with. Um, and my, my own feeling is, although that's a problematic concept, because much of what we're talking about was not necessarily unique to yeah. a colonial or colonial context, I do think it's useful. And one reason I think colonial violence is a useful concept is because of, of racial difference. Yeah. yeah. That said, um, it, it becomes really tricky to generalize because as you can imagine, the way black African Kenyans are racialized is quite different than the way Greek Cypriot Orthodox insurgents are racialized. Um, they're clearly both othered. They're both seen as savage in various ways and that, that justifies all kinds of brutality. Um, but uh, you know, to, to go to go beyond that, I think is is tricky because these these cases are are so different. Um, and, and honestly, I'm not sure it matters because the the sense of inferiority and difference is something which could be quite readily adapted to these very different uh, locales. Um, I think race becomes interesting in a different way, though, because as that uh, image I showed of the movement for colonial freedom demonstration in Trafalgar Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square might suggest, um, this is a moment when the racial makeup of Britain is itself changing. Uh, and, and because this is a moment when you have, um, you know, for the first time, significant numbers, I mean, really significant numbers of non-white um, British people who are attending rallies, who are interested in colonial issues, um, I, I think this does sort of provide a different um, context for a lot of uh, the concern. It provides a kind of new base for concern about colonial violence in Britain. There's a very large Cypriot immigrant population in London, particularly in North London, which becomes really important for a lot of these campaigns and marches and rallies. Um, certainly the, the Malayan Chinese population is, is much uh, smaller, but um, you know, I, I think um, 
uh, you know, Black West Indian and, and African populations are quite significant for Kenya and, and the Cypriot population is quite significant in the case of, um, of Cyprus. Um, and, and finally, I'll just say that I think it's, it's this convergence for people on the right. Uh, it's this convergence of increasing racial diversity at home and the sense that empire is slipping away abroad, which really feeds a lot of the anxiety, the sort of the racial apocalyptic thinking that you see on the right. Um, and it helps to explain why much of the right wing energy, xenophobia, virulence, which I think was uh, mobilized by these wars in the 1950s, ends up following the path of anti-immigrant sentiment later as we move into the 1960s and beyond. Yeah. So we still have time for, for, for another question. So if anyone wants to ask, uh, please, please write it in the Q&A. So, but I use the time. So my, I lived in Britain from 2011 and 2015, and I felt sometimes very German because, because it's a, um, Britain has, a, of course, a very different history discourse in comparison to German, to Germany. So what I found um, sometimes a bit, bit, um, yeah, a bit hard, hard to stand it was this: if you enter a British bookshop, you always have a good section of military history. And I, as a German, it's very subjective. Uh, this was a narrative of heroic British, white British fighting and winning wars in the last three hundred years. And even if you if you look at the Imperial War Museum, um, World War First World War Gallery, it's not about the empire; it's about white British on, on the Western Front. So my question would be: I mean, you, you, your your convincing argument was that violence in the colonies was always there; it was not hided; it was somehow in the discourse. But to which degree did this kind of colonial, post-colonial, post forty-five violence uh, had an impact on the British self-perception? Because uh, for me, as a German, uh, it's, it's always um, a centenary, et cetera, this narrative of, of, of we won the last 300 years, we are a nation of winners. Uh, and, and this might, might change in the last years because of post-colonial things. But would you, uh, of course, there are waves, ups and downs, but would you possibly, from your research, say, um, it's not that streamlined, it's, it's much more diverse, and there are also, people who are very reluctant to British self-perception or would you would you think that winning the Second World War or assuming of winning the Second World War was so so huge and St Paul's Cathedral and the Blitz and Churchill and, and all these icons the Hurricane the Spitfire everyone knows what a Spitfire is um, was so important that it was so overriding the the downsides of imperial history that yeah that it was still the bright shining um, self-perception or, or would you would you question that that narrative and think there there are more dark sides coming up to the surface well i i, th I think i mostly agree with you if i if i understand you correctly so you know i think one issue here is that um you know to the extent i feel sometimes what i'm uncovering partly here is a kind of tradition of, of british militarism which isn't always i mean david edgerton is someone who's written a lot about this but um isn't always a popularly um recognized. And, and I do think it's important to say not an elite tradition of militarism, which is what some, some uh, the kind of thing that Edgerton has written about, but a kind of demotic right wing enthusiasm for, for yeah. violence and brutality, which I think is very much there. I think that has to be understood in part as a consequence of the Second World War and yeah. a kind of, um, let's say, an uncritical attitude toward military action. And certainly, um, you know, the comparative history with Germany here would be very instructive in the 1950s, looking at things like attitudes for military service or conscientious objection, um, which is as unpopular and marginal as, as ever, conscientious objection that is in Britain yeah. in the 1950s. Although I do think the records of those who do object conscientiously to colonial war are, are really interesting and useful. Um, certainly numerically, it's not a huge um, population. So that I absolutely would link mm -hmm. to the idea of a good war. Um, that said, you, you invoked the idea of winning a lot. And I think one of the things that does create a sense of emergency in the 1950s is the sort of confusion of these wars, which are quite brutal, and I would say relatively openly brutal, um, which are sold as wars to preserve empire, which when they end are sold to the public as victories, and yet nonetheless culminate in the disintegration of the empire. I think there is a, there is a confusion there 
And there is a there is a sense of loss, but an unwillingness to fully reckon with that loss. And, and others who have written about decolonization have talked about this, which I think helps to explain why um, these wars end up, um, you know, demanding so much public attention in different ways, and, and ultimately why their legacy is so uh, complex. And would you think that they're undermining the British self-perception, really? Um, yeah. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, I, 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 when I was in Glasgow, we, we went to, to, to Glasgow Green and there was a Nelson column and a colleague of mine was also a professor said, you know, Sönke, we are a nation of winners. And this was not a joke. <laughs> so I know, I know of, course, of course, you will never have this in Berlin. I can, I can for, for obvious reasons, but I mean, this is, is possibly not, not, you know, representative, this opinion, but still, um, uh, at least on the conservative side, um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I felt very German in this, in this moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, clearly there is a reason, although I've argued you know, that this memory is more persistent and, and surfaces more than we might think. There's clearly a reason there are not many efforts to actively memorialize it in the way that the Second World yeah, War yeah. memorialized, right? This is not, this, obvious, is, not yeah. a, this is not a happy or, or a noble past. And, and so I think yeah. that's, you know, that's, that's quite clear. Um, but, no, but then nor have, have there been really official efforts until very recently. And even then I'd say they're quite half-hearted to try um, to stage an official reckoning in, in the way that, of course, you know, Germany has has modeled in so many ways. So, um, yeah, I, again, I think it's precisely the way in which um, not just the brutality seems to some contemporaries to fall short of British standards. And here, I would I would completely um, point um, not just to people outside the military and to left wing critics, but many of the soldiers who who write home in disgust when they see torture and related abuses say very specifically this is degrading the honor of the British military. This is not worthy of our great nation. So there is absolutely a kind of um, a, a patriotic, noble, maybe we can say aristocratic tradition of military service, which finds violence unsettling and, and, and criticizes it um, for that reason. Um, so I'm not sure if that's yeah, Eric, yeah. I have, I have, we, we were going to continue that. Uh, I have two two more questions. Oh, okay, okay, please. Um, yes. Um, yeah. So one question from the audience is, when you discuss colonial atrocities of the British Empire, detention camps, etc., it reminded me of the discussion about German colonial atrocities in Namibia, South of Africa. Dealing with history should also bring some ideas for a better future. Presently, the European Union has decided not to give uh, the kind to the world and looking onto the world map, there's no um, the kind in Africa. Um, so the dispute between European Union and Britain about AstraZeneca um, um, would it be a gesture if Britain and the EU would offer, you know, these vaccination of the whole of Africa. So the colonial history and now COVID-19 and, and the vaccination. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll very briefly respond to that because I know there's another question just to the point about Brexit, which is that, you know, one, and this goes back to your your comparative point um, at the beginning, Zunka, you know, one of my ambitions here is to try to talk about British history in, in a way that we also talk about continental European history. And I do think, you know, that the myths of British exceptionalism are becoming ever harder to sustain in the age of Brexit. And, and I do think it's important to talk about things like political extremism. Yeah political violence, um, things of that nature, even if the scale is not um, exactly commensurate, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge these presences as well in, in the British case. Yeah, and the last question would be, do you see a continuity in the actions and methods of the governments in Rhodesia and apartheid South Africa when fighting against liberation groups to the decolonization states of emergency policy of the UK? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And um, there are others who could answer it much better. I don't know if Dane Kennedy is still here, but he's written brilliantly about uh, Rhodesia. And in fact, Louise White has a brand new book on, on war writing from Rhodesia, which I would recommend to anyone who's interested. Um, I'll just say very briefly, yes, there, there are some quite direct lineages, even in terms um, not just of, of techniques and, and tactics, but personnel. Um, so there is a kind of rise of the peripatetic insurgent, or I should say counterinsurgent warrior um, these kind of burnt out cases uh, who jump from uh, Palestine to Malaya to Kenya to Cyprus. And, um, you know, it's, it's not exactly a mercenary group, but um, it is often by the time they get to Rhodesia. Um, but there is a kind of rise of, of the late colonial warrior, the, the white warriors who are trying to hold the tide against decolonization. 
Um, and I think many of them actually do see Rhodesia as, as a final um, stage in that battle. Um, Kathleen Ballou is a, a terrific historian of um, you know, American white power and white supremacist movements who has written about the significance of Rhodesia uh, to, to those groups. And so again, there are connections with sort of domestic racial politics, um, which I think are very intimately connected to these imperial. And the very last question, but now I end with that, but this is interesting. Could you say a few words on the role of the British monarchy in this process? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, terrific question. Uh, I would love to, uh, you know, as, as many of my uh, colleagues will know, the Royal Archives are very hard to get into. And in fact, yeah. they, have, they have absolutely no material open to researchers covering the current reign, which is to say the, the reign of Elizabeth II, which covers, of course, most of the period I'm interested in. So there, there are ways of working around that. There are real limitations there. I do think monarchy is important there. And of course, many of you will know from the crown, if not from elsewhere, that Elizabeth was in Kenya or she called it Kenya, uh, when she, she learned that she had become queen. Um, and so, uh, yeah, th there is a connection here because um, the royal practice of conferring decorations on soldiers was something which was alive and well in this period. Um, you often saw members of the royal family either um, bidding farewell to soldiers as they would leave, sometimes visiting them in the field and reviewing them, uh, or then welcoming uh, them back home. And as I say, sort of conferring awards and military honors on them. So um, there's very much a kind of mobilization of the nation embodied in the monarchy as, as part of the, uh, the effort to build build public support for these wars. Right, Eric, so I think we could we could uh, discuss these, these wonderful, not the wonderful, this most fascinating and interesting topic. It's not wonderful, unfortunately, no. um, topic for, for hours and hours and hours, but I, I end here and hand over to, to Barry, please. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you, Eric, for an excellent uh, talk and lecture. Um, thank you, Zünke, for a wonderful moderation. Um, you totally fulfilled the expectations, so uh, we will stay in touch. Um, <laughs> and uh, really, um, perhaps at some point when we will be allowed to open, uh, you will also be here at a, as a real person, not just oh, yeah, a hopefully, yeah. uh, person. Um, you were both very real today. Thank you so much. Um, Tomorrow we will have the next event, um, the US-Israel relationship under President Biden um, with um, President or American Academy President uh, Daniel Benjamin, <laughs> um, no, <that's> Jake <laughs> Wallace, uh, Shira Efron and Ulrich Schlie. Um, and on Thursday um, we will have the Daimler lecture entitled Harun Faroki, Forms of Intelligence Between Text and Image with our Daimler Fellow Nora Alter. Um, the audience today was in the beginning very shy, at the end, not at all. So um, if you have more questions, um, feel free to write them to us. We, um, not we, Eric will have to answer them. Um, oh, and yeah. Um, yeah. you can all try to work on your shyness on uh, Wednesday and Thursday again. So we hope to see you again. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Zunke. Um, that was an excellent evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. My pleasure.